Solomon, how the heck are you? It's great to have you here. Doing well. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. Great Pleasure is here. all mine. Awesome. So needless to say, we are here today to talk about microdosing, a topic I am not sure many people know more about than, than you three. <laughs> so to, to set up our discussion, um, whenever I get into a room with more than a couple of brilliant people on the other end of the mic, I tend to go a little bit quiet and move away from the traditional question answer interview format in favor of a real expert led discussion. So I'd like to open the floor when we do get into it and offer you all the opportunity over the next hour or so to ask each other questions and dig into the areas of microdosing that you all know best and are genuinely curious about in each other's work. So to kick things off, it would be great if you could each introduce yourselves, uh, tell us who you are and a little bit of your area of expertise. And Adam, since you are closest to me, I would love it if, uh, if you could kick things off. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us here today, Victoria. Uh, my name is Adam Bramlage. I'm the founder of Flow State Micro. We're a functional mushroom company and a microdosing educational platform. I work with clients one-on-one -on -one as well to optimize their microdosing experience. Um, also the teacher of the new microdosing masterclass with Psychedelics Today. So excited to be here talking about the class as well as Connor's newest study and uh, everything we've been learning over the last few years in microdosing. Great, thanks so much. And uh, how about you, uh, Dr. Fadman? Uh, remember, that's a PhD, be careful. <laughs> I have been criticized by mental patients actually for not having the right degree. Uh, no problem in the psychedelic world where they know that my psychology degree is fundamentally useless. <laughs> However, I do have 60 years of, of working with psychedelics, uh, the last 10 or 11 years with microdosing. Uh, and I have been working the last year um, both with with Adam publicly and uh, and Connor and I have a little back channel work that we're doing as well. So I'm just very glad to be here. And I also every once in a while think I'm actually in the the world where people say, I'd like to hear you talk about psychedelics in a public place. Um, let us say that the 40 years of the, in the desert didn't really... Um, wasn't as much fun as it was cooked up to be. What a time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, it is, uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. And certainly many of our listeners will be familiar with your work. And uh, you're, you're a great friend to our podcast. So thank you for, for joining us again. Thanks. Connor, last but not least. Yeah. So I'm Connor. I'm a neuroscientist at UCLA. And I got into the psychedelic and microdosing world in 2019 when I was working with Harriet DeWitt at the University of Chicago, but I've been following the psychedelic research sort of renaissance ever since um, 2013, really. I've been doing cannabis and cannabinoid research and have been interested in cannabis as a psychedelic. So my real broad interests in altered states of consciousness, that goes back for about more than a decade, um, but I've been working specifically with microdosing data since 2019. So happy to talk about the neuroscience of microdosing and the future neuroscience of microdosing studies that I'm that I'm hoping to get started soon. Yeah, we can't wait to get into that. We know you're up to some really exciting work. But to kick it off at the the very start of this story, uh, I'd love it if you, Adam, could um, dig into the you know the, the the earliest history of microdosing. It's my understanding from seeing some of your work and the research that you've done that um, microdosing isn't new. Far from it, and despite what some articles lead people to believe, it wasn't invented by coders in Silicon Valley. Can you tell us a little bit about the roots of microdosing and where it's believed, the, the earliest theories around where it started? Absolutely. Um, and that was what was so interesting to, me, interesting to me about microdosing was the idea of our historical use of it, our ancestral use. So Lots of research, and and I've found you know the real proof, the longest dating proof, is the astro of the Australian Aborigines and their use of paturi, um, an acacia-like plant or shrub that they take in small doses to aid in hunting, and that's what I began to find. Whether it was the Australian Aboriginals or the Raramari of Mexico, that all of these indigenous tribes for thousands of years have used microdosing, whether it's paturi or uh, peyote to aid in hunting, stimulation, 
um, appetite suppression, um, improving visual acuity. So it was really fascinating that, that there really is an ancestral use of microdosing, um, and it can be traced all the way back to the aboriginals, who again are believed to be the first people to leave Africa and unchanged for tens of thousands of years. So that was the farthest I could trace it back. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And in your research, when when did it begin to, um, you know, really rise in in popular like contemporary culture? <laughs> <laughs> it's due to this this gentleman below me that I, I'm so go. honored to be working with. He wrote a book, uh, Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, and chapter fifteen talked about can subperceptual doses of psychedelics improve mood and functioning. And it kind of uh, started the rebirth of the modern microdosing movement. Um, and, you know, no one could tell you uh, about that better than, than him, Jim himself. So uh, he is responsible for the rebirth of this movement. Um, it's not to say people weren't doing it and having benefits, but he gave people a home to contact him, to fill him in on what was going on. And, you know, we're sitting here today talking about microdosing because of James Fadiman and um, I think it's important for people to know that. Well, Indeed. Um, yeah, and and I I really represent a kind of how how ignorance uh, runs science, which is um, the idea that had been used for the past twenty or thirty thousand years never occurred to me, and I had no knowledge of it. Um, I couldn't have been more insular. And uh, a friend, Robert Fort, said, you know, Albert Hoffman actually uses very small doses. And I learned later to take walks in the wood and to think. Um, and that's how it started, which is, huh, that's interesting. Um, I've spent 30 or 40 years looking at the highest, highest usable doses where you find out that you're divine and that you've, you've, never, you've never been born and you'll never die. And, you know, that kind of useful, practical stuff that we all know are the center of psychedelics. And I found out there's a whole other world, just a whole other channel or a whole other um, way of going about it, which has totally different effects. And microdosing's best, best definition is it is not at all like a high dose, and it is not at all like a little high dose. Okay? It's kind of the difference between FM and AM, which is it's different. And it has a bunch of extraordinary uses. Again, going back to what Adam was saying, most of which had been discovered thousands of years ago and are still being used by indigenous people who do not read the journals and don't read the media either. So that's where we started. And um, because it's inherently interesting for people to find that their consciousness can be improved, not necessarily changed, and that their whole physical system can also be improved. Microdosing has, a, a, has found a natural niche, which is it might be good for you, and as far as we can tell, it's very, 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 very rarely bad for you. And that's a nice risk reward ratio. And so, and thank you for that. I know you've done, um, you know, a ton of research in this space and you've worked with countless people who've chosen to start microdosing at some point. What, what can you tell us about the conditions or functions that people turn to microdosing for help with? Well, there's, there are two conditions. One is if they're not feeling well, and the other is if they are feeling well. So, but only those two groups, <laughs> nobody else. Okay? Okay. <laughs> now, now, we know that's silly because we have a, a system which says we have an incredibly developed system if you're not well. We have an incredibly poorly developed legal system if you are well. And we have very few things that cross over. Most of the, however, things that make you feel weller are also good if you're not well, but not the other way around. So here was something that had two groups of users, people who were recovering from or healing from a host of conditions, depression being the first one we, we kind of looked at. And here's another group of people who said, I'm really doing fine, but I could actually be healthier. I could actually be more focused in my work. I could actually improve my physical functioning. And I don't have to be ill in order to get better. That's a, we don't, it's hard to, it's hard to get when you hear about it, but there's nothing in the healing system. There's don't have, they don't have a place for enhanced wellness. 
Those of us, however, who are human and live on the planet have an enormous place for enhanced wellness and microdosing fits into both groups in different ways and in some very subtle and surprising ways, um, which take a little more explanation. Yeah, I'm so glad that that you mentioned this idea of betterment. It's something that we talk about a lot around here. We talk about the use of psychedelics for healing. Um, but, you know, that's something that does get left out of the conversation a little bit is this idea of using them for for general betterment. You know, you don't I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly that you don't need to be a sick person looking to get well to to benefit from um, psychedelics 100%. And that was the traditional youth use originally, not necessarily for healing. It was to be better hunters, you know, um, it, it was a betterment thing. So we have a long history of this use and which is why I think Connor is so important in the future of microdosing and all the research and studies that he's doing. Hundred percent. I'm I'm very interested in what uh, what you have to say, Connor. Having done quite a bit of clinical research and having published published papers on uh, the neuroscience of microdosing in your studies at the U University of Chicago, can you tell us a bit about some of your your research or the work that you've been doing? Right. Well, some of the stuff that I'm working on now is not published yet, and I'll kind of save that for the master class. But it's comparing some of these use cases of wellness. So for instance, caffeine is like a classic example where you don't really take coffee if you're sick, of course, um, but people do drink caffeine to try to improve their cognitive output. And there's one example we have in the laboratory where we're comparing these microdoses of LSD to doses of amphetamine, doses of cannabis, and seeing, comparing and contrasting what's happening in the brain and how people are responding to these things to try to kind of get a better feel for how they may differ, whether or not a microdose might result in a, a greater cognitive output, maybe less of the harmful effects. Personally, I'm, I'm pretty anti-coffee and caffeine. I always try to not drink coffee every month and eventually sort of like relapse and then maybe having a cup, you know, once or twice a month. But um, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about coffee and caffeine in comparison to some of these uh, psychedelics, especially the, the microdoses of psilocybin. We start talking about benefits, you know, pros and cons and things. Um, but just to kind of briefly touch on what we did do in the laboratory, there was neuroscience of microdosing studies going on before I got to the University of Chicago. They had already kind of compared 0, 13, and 26 micrograms of LSD to one another just on basic um, self-report measures, like how much do you feel it? Finding that 26 was definitely something they could feel relative to placebo, 13, a little bit higher than placebo, and six was basically indistinguishable. 13 was closely matched with placebo as well. Then they put people in fMRI scanners, and that's a way of looking at what parts of the brain are becoming more active. And they found that the control parts of your brain were becoming more connected to your emotion parts of your brain. So it was greater prefrontal cortex control over amygdala emotional output. So there's kind of this indication that there could be this ability to have more of a suppressed anxiety type of response just by looking at people in these fMRI scanners. That was pretty interesting, just on these microdoses. And then when I came in, I joined in on another type of neuroimaging study, which is called EEG, which gives you an ability to look at brain reflexes, kind of like responses uh, to different stimuli, cognitive types of tasks, emotional types of tasks, as well as looking at brain activity. And what we found is the pattern of brain activity that we see in very large doses, higher doses of psychedelics, we were also seeing to some extent with the microdoses. And so specifically it was with respect to these brain waves. And without going too much into detail about this, generally a brain wave is reflective or indicative of less brain activity. So if you have big delta waves, you know, you're asleep, your brain's not very active. What's interesting about psychedelics is that all of the brain waves from delta through gamma are suppressed. So there's basically more brain activity happening kind of across the board. And you do see that with these microdoses of LSD, even when people don't feel that they're on anything, they have this interesting neural response that could be indicative of a neurotherapeutic type of signal. And when you look at that with people with cannabis, very high doses of like psychedelic doses of cannabis, they don't have that type of response either. So it's unique to the serotonergic type of activity that's happening, not so much with the altered states. So that's another interesting kind of uh, thing that, that was going on there. The new study that we just published this year, I won't go too much into detail now, but it was looking at these emotional responses, emotional types of reflexes, in a, an emotional processing task or a reward processing task. And 
there we saw really interesting facilitations in the brain. So increased brain responses, increased reward processing, emotional processing happening on these microdoses as well. So even though you know you might be on a dose that you can't distinguish from placebo, there are still really interesting things happening in the brain. And now some next steps are how do we compare that to other substances, other types of you know amphetamine or, or cannabis? And then also, this is all just when we give people that particular microdose in the laboratory and then check out your brain two hours later when it might be in its like peak effect. But what about a Fatiman protocol? What about taking a look at this after a month or two months and then applying these interesting measures of cognition, of emotion, objective measures, brain measures, neural markers of these things and seeing people who have really high anxiety, who have this very large emotional sort of outcome measure in the brain, is that tuned back? Are we able to sort of suppress some of those neural markers of, of that type of emotional output after a month's long protocol. That stuff has not been done yet. And that's where I'm really excited to try to get word out about our ability to, to do that, to track people's brains as they go through these protocols, not just tracking their subjective responses. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of so excited. I'm <laughs> going to embarrass myself if I don't watch out. Um, but what has happened is there's a lot of microdosing studies now out there, some of them good. However, there's almost none of them that replicate what human beings actually do. Human beings do not go into a laboratory, take a microdose once, sit around all day and do an enormous number of, of measures and tests and being bored, and then go home. That's not microdosing. That's kind of like if you go to the symphony and it's Beethoven's fifth and you get the first seven notes and you go home. <laughs> and someone says, how is the concert? You say, well, compared to, you know, it's a nonsense event. So what Connor is saying is we're actually going to do work like it is in the world. So we're not going to create laboratory science. We're going to try and replicate citizen science, which is what people have done uh, in the last 30,000 years. So this is really exciting stuff. And um, I am delighted to get to know more of it as I'm learning right now, some that I didn't know. So yeah, wow. bring, bring the laboratory to the people. You know, it is it is it is in science, um, and we can do this now. This technology did not exist just a few years ago. So behind me, you actually see there's this headband on this Greek statue. That's an EEG headband that people can wear just for five minutes with your eyes closed in a resting state, is what it's called, and that can give you these experimental measures of cognition and emotion. Which in the laboratory we see that people with really high anxiety will have these suppressed emotional outputs. People who have had higher substance use disorder issues will have suppressed cognitive types of outputs. So let's put that to the test. I mean, if someone's struggling with addiction, they're struggling with anxiety, we'll take a little baseline at the, at the start of the month and then we'd like to track you. Maybe once a week, you can do it daily maybe, you'll have a nice output report card that shows a nice little timeline, uh, you know, a line graph of, of how these things may or may not be changing. Um, and it's hard to kind of fool the brain. You know, you can maybe have a, a good placebo effect if you're trying to ask someone, how much do you think your cognition's improving today or emotions improving today? But it's, it's harder to fool the brain into having a different answer. And so that, that's another thing I think is really exciting about this type of study. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, can you put the headphones on the, the, the headband on someone on a roller coaster? <laughs> You know, you probably could, but generally what happens is, is that you're not just recording brain activity. Yeah, too much jiggle, right? You're recording the electrical activity of the body. And so you're going to get heartbeat responses in there. And anytime you have any type of muscle movement, you're going to get that too. Even eye blinking or moving your eyeballs left and right are going to send signals that the EEG will pick up. So for that reason, you have to reduce all of that noise and just be as still as you possibly can to, to get this really clean signal. But, you know, if you had enough data, then maybe someone's like, what about, you know, flow states on a skateboard, you know, things like that. You know, sure. The more, you know, quantity you have, then the quality of the data is not going to be uh, as much of a problem. You can average out those those uh, those noise signals. OK, there is one other study which um, I can fill in, but but it's a little complicated, but it's being done in New Zealand. And it's a clinical study. And basically, they're replicating citizen science even one step more which is they're saying, oh, you have a particular uh, diagnosis. Here is a month worth of microdoses. Please take them at the appropriate times and let us know how it goes. 
which is if you think about it, any of you that have been on any psychiatric medications know that's exactly what you were told. So we're now beginning to, to kind of replicate not medical research, but medical use. And that's, that's, a, that's a kind of a seismic shift in how microdoses are being treated. So very excited, <laughs> but I'll, I'll hang on for the roller coaster. <laughs> there was some news that recently dropped in Canada where I'm uh, where I'm based around the approval of the first psilocybin take home study in the veteran population. How close? Oh, yeah. yeah. How close um, do you do you all think we may be to seeing um, take home studies like those that you're that you're talking about in in the U.S.? Well, this particular study that I'm talking about with these brain measures, by the time this is, you know, aired, um, people could go to what is synotics.com, P-S-Y-N-A-U-T-I-C-S.com and, and order these headbands. So this is a self-funded study. So we're not, you know, funded by some big corporate entity or, or the government. It's just, if you want to track your brain health on experimental measures, you can do that. And the more people we have sign up, the more it's going to feed our model of exactly what these brain measures tell us. Because this is, you know, sort of just the frontier of, of brain science. We haven't had this technology to do this at scale before. It's only been, you know, a handful of people coming in the laboratory. So we can test all sorts of hypotheses using microdoses as one sort of measure. But then also, how does that compare to a number of other things people might be doing? Maybe they started an SSRI. Maybe they're starting some type of therapy. And so, you know, that's that's going to be, I think, a really interesting you know, way of looking at this. Anyone could could sign up. Um, it's kind of in beta in the sense that we're walking and chewing gum at the same time as far as continuing. You know, we're kind of tweaking things as we go as far as making it nice and easy for people to to sign up and everything. But as far as right now, I and mean, someone could easily get one of these headbands, I'll ship it out to them and, you know, we'll just start collecting data on this. Yeah, really cool. So what are the, the criteria to to participate? Literally, there is no criteria. Yeah, um, it's it's just if you want to track your, it's it's kind of like twenty three and Me. So if you want to get information on your genetics, there's no criteria for that. You can ask, you know, send uh, get a get a kit to test your genetics and send it back. So it's not research in the traditional yes. sense. The research happens on the back end. So same with twenty three and Me. If a researcher wants to use those data, then the folks who opted in to have their data be used by academic researchers, um, the researcher will be able to do a particular study on that. So the way this is kind of set up, it's the same thing. We'll bring in the data, like be able to house it. Maybe it goes on to an open science foundation platform. Researchers like myself can then come in and then run a particular analysis the way that they would like to do it. Now, now I just <clears throat> want to be clear. Open science, this is a method where you actually put your data up there so anybody can look at it. It isn't uh, kind of hidden deeply inside of a obscure publication in an obscure journal. And it isn't even in there. It's just a little footnote that says you can get hold of the data if you really know how to play the game. This is, again, returning. I'm just very excited that the idea that human beings like you and I are able to participate as we would normally do. You know, I was thinking, um, I'm gonna, you know, I wish I could have done a research study, which is how can I figure out if Taylor Swift's music is liked. And then if I got a large grant and I had a, a you know a stable of people to help and I had a lot of measuring instruments and I could look hook people up, I could waste everyone's time for years. Uh, but we have this wonderful method in the culture, which is um, Taylor Swift is self-funded. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a model up there about... Um, how things are can be observed and appreciated in the culture, irrespective of what the scientific level of analysis shows. And I would say that the history of microdosing um, is a lot closer, I mean, not the same numbers yet, but a lot closer to Taylor Swift than it is to the Journal of Psychopharmacology. Well said. Yeah, and there's yeah. different levels of scientific rigor, but the more you try to control something in the laboratory, the more you lose what's naturally happening in the world, as Jim had said earlier. So yeah, I can do a nice big fMRI, EEG, multimodal, come in the lab, and then now, like, what is, what is this experience for me? What's actually happening here? So you want to be able to paint a picture of what's nature 
And so to do that, you want to have all these different looks at things, but you can't ignore the full picture. You have to have kind of a holistic view. And then having these types of self-funded studies, citizen science provides a huge window into what's going on. So I think it corresponds and, and, and sort of matches up nicely or provides that, that fuller picture of, of research that we need. Yeah. You know, what I'm, I'm thinking is if you think of the ecology um, strides we've made, we used to talk about saving a species. And then someone said, where does the species live? And don't you have to uh, protect where it's living if you're going to have it thrive rather than just save the little species and burn the forest down around it? Um, so now we don't talk about saving species. We talk about preserving habitat. Now, if you want to think about what we call set and setting in the psychedelic world, it's a nice transfer. So if you had to, um, you know, make a few educated guesses, what, uh, how, how do you anticipate the results of, of the research changing um, from what you see in the lab when people are, are taking and monitoring um, their, their brain activity out in the world while they're microdosing? Changing in terms of the landscape of how we do science or just the differences in our results that we'll get between those two different... The differences in the results. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for one, we're going to have a lot more people be able to participate when you open sure. it up to a citizen science type of platform. Um, and so you have a lot more statistical power. I think, you know, it comes down to quantity versus quality. Uh, hopefully they're, they're going to match up and you would see basically the same types of results but they would help to verify and validate each other. I think, that, I think that's what's really important. Um, but you know, you're not able to address, so for instance, one thing you can't really do in the laboratory right now is look at these more long-term effects. Um, and so if we wanted to track someone over weeks or months, that's just not feasible. That's a limitation of the laboratory, the brick and mortar laboratory environment. Um, so being able to do these types of studies out in more of the natural world, that really opens up and, and allows us to skirt that limitation. Um, but you know, these EEG headbands are also limited. You only have a couple electrodes in the front. What if we want to know what's going on more in the default mode network, for instance? Well, you'll probably have to get a more sophisticated EEG system. So every, every single type of thing you do in science or looking into nature, you're always going to be limited to some degree. And so again, it's the more tools that we have, the more perspectives that we can get onto a certain thing, the richer our, our understanding of that thing will be. And so I think in the future, you know, it'll be much more common to use these types of large scale studies, citizen science types of studies to help inform what's going on in the laboratory. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so and, and when, Adam and so is, you say Adam that by the time- at the intersection of both of these, kind of looking at the research and is a citizen scientist and gets reports from the field, not from the lab. And how does this all feel to you, Adam? I feel like I don't have a PhD like the two of you do, but I'm so happy that you do because I didn't have to go to school and get one. So <laughs> thank you so much. But yeah, like <clears throat> that right there is the father of modern microdosing and Connor, in my opinion, is the future, right? There's so many people who will not buy into this until it's proven by modern science. And that's why Connor and his work is so important. Um, and this new study with the wireless headbands and the idea that every citizen scientist on the planet can write Connor at Connor at psychonautics.com and be a part of this study and get a wireless headband. I mean, that is fascinating. That is taking microdosing out of a sterile lab and putting it into the natural environment where it came from as hunter gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years. So I'm just so excited to be working with both these guys that Flow State can help be a part of this EEG headband study with Synodics and Connor and and that Dr. Fadiman PhD is here to uh, be our elder in this space and oversee it all and, and help us from making those mistakes that uh, you know maybe he made early on in his life. So I'm just happy to be here. No PhD, citizen scientist, that's me. <laughs> well, uh, Connor and I are both laughing because we are aware of the different difference between what we went through to get a PhD and what we actually do. And and I remember at one point, of maybe eight years out of my PhD at Stanford, I applied for a job at Stanford in the psychology department. And the uh, head of the department was someone I'd, I'd known and worked with. 
And he said, you know, we really don't like to take in our own graduates because, you know, you learned it about from us. So you're not, you know, contributing much original. And he looked at me and said, but you don't use much of what we taught you, do you? And I said, none, sir. (laughs) And he said, okay, you can apply for the job. (laughs) So uh, I think that I agree with Adam. Um, He should be grateful to people like us who took a lot of years out of our life that could have been spent uh, differently. (laughs) And. And, and we get to know stuff in a particular way. And we're also admitted into certain clubs that hold certain amounts of information and power that is valuable. My background in my PhD was all in lab rats. And so I clearly don't, <laughs> don't work with lab rats or give you know, microdoses to lab rats anymore. But yeah, I did, it did give me a lot of great basic understanding of the brain, neuroplasticity. And I'm still applying. I'm actually working now with C. elegans. So another model organism system, and that's something that uh, Jim and I are working together on and, and looking at plasticity in that, in that system. And so it's translational neuroscience. It's bridging that gap between this preclinical animal world and, and the human world and then you know, out of the lab into the natural world. And so, yeah, I mean, again, all of these different windows onto the nature of the thing here. Yeah, I think that's really, that's really the metaphor, which is the more windows, the more you see different views and there's nothing good or bad about any particular window except how clean it is and how big it is which <laughs> the right. world is huge yeah yes well we're opening up bigger bigger windows in more directions than has been the case in the past um and again we're not using uh, very rarely we're not we are using a, a, a increases in technology, but we're not like doing something very out of the box for the system. You know, we've learned how to measure the brain in all kinds of ways. We overemphasize how cool that is because we don't know how to measure much else in the body the same way. Um, But we can now ask questions and get answers that we couldn't a few years ago. And that that's true in citizen science as well. Uh, And I was thinking of people, um, going to work in, in Colin's study or being in a, members of Colin's study, microdose.me, who asked people, would you please microdose and take a lot of psychological instruments and reports, not only once, but every few weeks for a couple of months. And if you'd like, you may do all of the same work and not microdose, and you're then called a control group. They have 22,000 people that signed up from 81 countries. So we're not talking about something that's some little exotic corner of the psychedelic world. Right. So I mind too. And I saw that number this week, 22,000. Well, we'll have to link you up with, with them because I I consult with them and they're all people that would, that not only you would like, but most of them would also understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Would love that. Would love that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll make that happen. And you saw it right here on this podcast when this connection was made between a brilliant young researcher and a group of other brilliant researchers from from about six different countries who are already working with each other, swapping studies and so forth. Awesome. Yay. (laughs) James, I got to ask you, what is it like to have worked in this field for so long and now to see and to work with uh, young researchers who are really, um, you know, you're able to, to pass the torch to? What, what, what is that like? Well, the first thing, and, and uh, my wife, Dorothy, and we've been married for 60 years, so we, we know each other pretty well. She said, she said, I'm so glad you're alive. We say that in general. But we say, I'm so glad you're alive because you get to see what happens when they take away the restrictions of normal human curiosity, of science, of legislation. And so we're now moving into an era where, this should, you know, let me frame this, where it's not going to be illegal to want to improve your own health in a safe manner. Now, the, uh, we will look back on this era when people actually, they will say, you actually prevented people from healing themselves? 
Was this, did you have a reason for that? Well, yeah, President Nixon didn't like hippies in the 1960s. So we passed laws to prevent neurochemical and biological and physiological and psychological research on these substances for 40 years, even though at the time they were made illegal by his need to hate people. They were the most psychiatric, they're most researched psychiatric drugs in the world. So we're coming out of a strange darkness, which has been totally accepted by most of the scientific community as if it were had been reasonable. That's one of the most fascinating things. So I love it. I have the best time. I go on, you know, I, I get all these wonderful articles about what we already knew, you know, 40 years ago and now has been proved and so forth. And also the the citizens, the level of citizen science sophistication is going way up. Um, I work with a, I, I work with a group in Australia periodically, and we're being trained to be uh, psychedelic clinicians. And the level of their understanding, these are different groups each each year, but the level of their understanding and the level of sophistication of their questions in general keeps going up. So what we're doing is we are raising the floor, and and. You know, I mean, that that Connor is both exceptional and has a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point about raising the educational awareness of, I mean, if you're talking about improving your health, you have to have a good sense of your own health. So it's like, you know, at a certain time, we didn't realize how unhealthy cigarettes were or certain types of diets or alcohol or things like that. And now we get a little bit more educated. Well, what about your education about your brain? neuroscience is pretty young the the culture is now becoming more aware of the brain and so one thing that i'd like to do as well is not only track help people track their brain but give you a little bit of information of exactly what you're tracking you know it's easy to know what a heart rate you know is i have a fast heart rate versus a slow heart rate but what the heck is a slower you know faster brain wave a larger or smaller amplitude of that brain wave so those are types of things i'd like to kind of help people learn and then they can use that knowledge to ask more sophisticated questions or just have a better awareness of their own brain and mental health too. Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of the uh, practical side of mindfulness. This is after you open your eyes and sit up, what are you going to do with a little more mindfulness? And the answer is probably understand yourself better in ways that were not, that you never thought of doing. And then what the other thing you do is you share it with your friends and your friends say, but I don't understand what you said, but I, but I can see you're healthier. And that's how we're now developing courses like the one we're talking about, um, because there's now a need. See, we're not we're not creating a need anymore. We're meeting it as much as we can uh, and as and as well as we can. And five years from now, this same course will be different in its details, but not in its fundamental form, which is how do people make their own lives work better in a way that's safe and effective. The need is certainly there. Microdosing is something that we get asked about at Psychedelics Today uh, quite quite a lot. And um, you know, my personal opinion, the the course couldn't have come at a better time. It's quickly becoming very popular. And uh, yeah, people have questions um, about how they can use microdosing to improve their lives. And I, I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective and, you know, three-way question, anybody jump in and answer, what does the ideal future of microdosing look like in terms of access, in terms of uh, awareness? Like what 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 does the ideal future look like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road in terms of microdosing? Well, I'll, I'll give you one that, that none of us hope and that has an easy way forward, which is psychedelics will be controlled by a few multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies who will dole it out through the medical system to people who can afford it. Okay, that's 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 the darkest one. Um, the wonderful thing about that is I left out mushrooms, and mushrooms um, mushrooms don't know they're illegal, so don't tell them. 
because they grow at least psilocybin mushrooms there's like 200 species and they grow in every continent and they like to grow in what is called disturbed soil which is soil that man or women never all of us humanity has messed with which is dug up irrigated construction near that's where psilocybin says oh i like hanging out near people they make the soil just perfect for me so we have the the dark We'd love to control it and patent it and profit and help people who can pay whatever it is we can charge. And on the other side, we have mushrooms saying, I grew here with these chemicals that fit exactly into receptors in your brain before you were existing. And I won't tell you why that worked that way. I mean the mushrooms. That's one of the questions you as human beings get to ask. So uh, that's the range. The range is also that you go to the store and you say, um, oh, I really have these headaches. What do you recommend? He says, well, I used to recommend you know, aspirin and Tylenol, but most of the, my people who come in here say they really prefer these little, um, these little canisters with psilocybin mushrooms. Now, now, you have to use these well, within a year. They do degrade because they're organic. So that's what I'd recommend. Well, thank you, Mr. Pharmacist or Mrs. Pharmacist. So that's 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 probably the range. And I haven't I haven't mentioned that that psychedelics work better when you pay attention. Now that's not true of most pharmaceuticals, or they never tell you. So let me let me flip it back to Adam because my vision didn't include this incredibly diverse world of coaching. Yeah, I mean, it would be important that if somebody's prescribed something like microdoses, that they have some kind of education behind it. You know, when a doctor prescribes you a Xanax or something like that, I hope they're at least going to go over the side effects and contraindications. So, so yeah, there's an importance to coaching therapists, people who are going to educate people to use these substances so they use them safely, effectively, and properly. You know, when I moved to California 14 years ago, it was for cannabis, and it was because I saw it going legal, and I saw a future for people with medical issues. 14 years ago, people in Michigan laughed at me when I said cannabis was going to be legal all across the country in 14 years, and here we are. So I think psychedelics is going to have a similar rollout, and I really hope that we do things differently than we have with legal cannabis. I saw the entire small farmer legacy heritage of California, Oregon, and many of these states just be destroyed by big business. And we got to make sure that that doesn't happen again with psychedelics. So the decriminalization movement is the most important movement. It's probably more important than the legalization movement. If we defund the drug war and we stop putting people away for using these substances, then if it does go legal, and it goes the dark side way that Jim talks about where corporations control everything. Well, then people who can't afford a $3,500 psilocybin retreat in Tobanga Canyon can grow their own under their bed without fear of arrest, can share it with their friends, can continue to have indigenous people from other countries with the sacred traditions come up and lead their ceremonies without fear of arrest. So I think it's really about decriminalization. We need to end the drug war and we need to stop putting people away for this. You know, Dr. No, we, also, we also have some research which says if you simply take the Fatiman fantasy and you get it off the pharmacy shelf, a certain percentage of you, and a rather high percentage, will use it for a little while and then say, well, I don't know, and put it away. If, however, you get it from a coach and you are willing to pay attention to something that can, for example, alleviate the past 20 years of depression. Now, that's, that's worth paying attention to. And it turns out that people in coaching groups, the, the number of people who leave is almost insignificant. So there is something about taking the substance, knowing what you're doing, getting support when you need it, that is different than just taking the substance. I think it's a little bit like saying to someone, and you've done this, all of us have done it, this book is terrific. You'll love it here. And then you say two months later, what'd you think about that terrific book? Oh, oh yeah, I, I have it somewhere. Okay. Um, versus 
you know, if you've ever been in a writer's or reader's group, um, you learn things about what you've just read that you never would have imagined you'd have to come to on your own. So we're developing, and this is part of this next generation, we're not only getting research that is well worth doing, but we're getting methods of training, treatment, coaching, support, integration that we just haven't had before and that are not part of most of the indigenous traditions. So we're actually doing something other than following along with the hunter-gatherer societies. And, um, you know, the Aborigines in Australia 30,000 years ago probably knew what they were doing. But that won't work for us as well as doing what we know how to do very well. And that's why I'm part of this and why Adam and I keep working together. And Connor and I keep working together. Yeah, education is the most important thing. Like right now, as far as moving psychedelics forward into the mainstream, it's all about education because everybody's been lied to. The war on drugs and Nixon and the misinformation campaign, it worked. They were ex they were incredible at what they were trying to do, which is scare everybody about LSD, which Jim pointed out was the most researched chemical or drug in the world at the time that, you know, Nixon made it illegal. So I think education is really the most important thing, right? And they did a survey of 32,000 new microdosers, 20 to 40% of them quit within the first three days because they weren't properly educated. They were taking too much of the substance and they were feeling uncomfortable. So there are a lot of ways that even an experienced psychonaut may not know how to safely and effectively use microdosing. And let's be honest, while these substances aren't deadly, you're not going to die from taking them. You can definitely take a large dose and then get yourself in a deadly situation like driving a car or being in the wrong set and setting. So as this gets more popular, education is the most important thing, which is why this class and and a, and a platform like Psychedelics Today and this podcast is so important. It's because we've been lied to. We've been lied to for thousands of years. And it's time for us to you know really speak about the truth and learn the truth. That's my background is in education. I was a teacher before I got into cannabis. So that's why this is so important to not only teach the youth, but to teach adults and uh, people in my parents' generation the, the truth about these drugs and these psychedelics. Yeah, just seconding and thirding all of that. And just wanted to add a little bit of perspective. I work in a cannabis lab now, and I do predict that a lot of what we've seen with cannabis is going to be following um, the same, you know, sort of rollout with, with psilocybin and psychedelics as far as how it may be adopted medicinally and and regulated. So by that, I mean that with cannabis, is it considered a medicine? Well, it's considered to have medicines within it. And so there are companies that have extracted or synthesized THC and CBD, and those are approved and by different governments, including the United States for certain indications. And so I think that that'll also happen likely with psilocybin to be approved for certain indications. It'll be standardized and in a bottle and, you know, in a capsule, however it's, you know, given. But at the same time, we also have cannabis that's legal for people to consume outside of that sort of more structured medical way. And so what they do, if you do go to a doctor and, and you're interested potentially in, in wondering whether you might benefit from cannabis, you can have a recommendation by the MD, not a prescription necessarily. You could also have a recommendation to take the, the medical marijuana. And so even though it's you know, a plant as opposed to a, you know, a, an approved medicine. I think that might be the same case with the mushroom. So there could be a recommendation by the MD. We recommend this mushroom, you know, full body extract or whatever. You can get it, you know, available. You don't have to have a prescription. But in those cases, they might also recommend, hey, you know, there are these coaches out there that can take this a step further beyond what they teach us at the medical school. There, you know, that this this goes back thousands of years and and having that going on as well. So that's kind of the future I feel like is, is you know, again, the same roadmap is sort of what we have with cannabis, except it goes deeper because of, you know, the integrations and things like that that are associated with, with psychedelics and, and even at the microdose level. So it's just kind of my little uh, input perspective. Yeah, we, we ha it's hard to get because when you're in a, you know, when you're telling fish about water is really hard because they just can't grasp that there's anything other than it's always been. People brought up in con contemporary science suffer from some of the same problems. Um, real case. 
I was asked to give a presentation, kind of the lecture of the week, to a medical school, which included students and faculty in a wonderful medical school, which had some psychedelic research going on inside it. And as I talked and took mainly questions and answers, it was increasingly clear to me that the medical students already were almost unable to fathom the idea that there was factual material which was not peer-reviewed, double-blind, journal-written. And it was a little scary because these were all people who were interested in psychedelics. Like most medical students, they'd had experience, but they were buying into a kind of um, religious system which said anything, uh, any kind of evidence outside of this system is not evidence. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and I was, I was shocked by it because uh, I have lots of friends across the country who are individual medical students who don't have that problem. But they also very often say, I don't say much uh, when I'm in school, which is what I did when I was getting my degree uh, with Stanford's only psychedelic dissertation. Um, the door opened a crack and they, they, they found me out and closed the door. So things are changing. And this is the kind of informational a venue which we never had. Okay. I did a series yeah, I did a series on drugs and children in the in the 1960s for PBS called Drugs Colon the Children Are Choosing. As in da 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 da. And there wasn't there was very little that I could say because I was um, children had already learned to turn off uh, as one group of students said to me, if it has a white coat and says it's from the government, I know it's not true. Um, that's not a good system. Um, we've done a little better. And again, people like Connor are like inside the system as it's beginning to grow. Um, but it's got, a, it's got a ways to go yet. And fortunately, citizen science and naturally occurring substances are driving the change. Yeah, and back to what Connor said about the potential legal rollout, he, he's absolutely right, right? They're going to follow precedent. So what's the only precedent? It's cannabis, right? So from a business perspective, they're going to have a Bureau of Psilocybin Control or Psychedelic Control that's going to be in charge of coming to your facility and making sure that you have a proper security plan. I mean, all of the hurdles that I had to hop through and the, you know, the major money you had to pay to get your space approved and to jump through your hoops, it's going to happen, right? And you're probably going to have to get that doctor recommendation first, right? It's not going to be like where it's legal to everybody right away. You're going to probably have to have a condition, something like that. But from a business standpoint, you know, there's going to be a bureau that controls it. You're going to have to, you know, make sure that your facility is safe. All of your products are going to be triple lab tested. You know, all of these safety measures that are taken from other areas are going to be brought into this area. What's important is that we give people the decriminalized option as well, along with that legal option. But Connor's exactly right. It's going to be medical recommendations from doctors, um, and then it's going to be facilities that are strongly regulated by the state. Well, let me let me be cheerful here, since I've been gloomy also as well, which is um, the first two experiments are quite interesting. Oregon has ended up with an amazing maze of regulations. Um, which are neither medical nor necessarily beneficial, um, but, they're, but they're full of all the protections that Adam is talking about. Um, Colorado did something quite interesting. Um, as I understand it, and I haven't read it word for word, but what just passed was there are two ways in which you can use psilocybin. One is in a licensed facility, and again, they don't have any rules yet, or not meaning you can grow it at home or get it from a friend. So we now have a two-tiered market, um, kind of like uh, moonshine alcohol, and you can buy it at the store. Only in this case, we're talking psychedelics. And I think uh, Colorado's done a very remarkably simple solution to the need for Absolutely well-trained, solid personnel with real information for people who need the help. And 
the friend next door who's growing it because their mother who's who is starting to lose it cognitively does wonderfully on mushrooms and remembers more things and is more fun and is basically more functional so those are the, those are the so we're we're at a place where the there are different waves breaking on different beaches um and we fortunately the wonderful thing about the united states is we have 50 possible mistakes that you can make before you have to have a federal regulation and we're doing fine with the two we've got so far so good indeed <laughs> So, gentlemen, we're we're wrapping up our time, and the discussion has been great. I'm curious if there's anything that um, you know, any any topics that uh, we should be be covering in our last minutes together that we haven't had any any time to talk about yet. Is there any any burning final thoughts from uh, any three of you? I just want Connor to clearly give his email address and let everybody know how they can get a hold of him for this groundbreaking new study with the wireless EEGs. I think that's really important. Yeah. So anyone can contact me at Connor at synotics.com. Again, that's P-S-Y-N-A-U-T-I-C-S.com. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very preliminary thing, but again, it's ready now for us to give you these experimental measures. Um, so please check out the website and contact me if you'd like to get a headband. Uh, happy to ship it out to you. And um, you can keep it for a month or if you want to continue to kind of rent it out, you can sort of add continuations onto your rental. And um, yeah, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to track, but we can give you some guidelines as well as far as, um, you know, of course, instructions on doing it and, um, you know, how often might be recommended if you're doing like a month or two month protocol. And fortunately, a lot of what you just said will be in the program notes, right? You got it. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. It'll all be there. Okay. Yeah. So get uh, ready for your inbox to blow up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I guess uh, if, you know, um, my info commercial is if you've used microdosing and it's for a condition or a situation that most people don't have any idea why, that it worked for you, um, let me know. I'm always collecting what I call miracle stories because they're miracles to conventional medicine. And I'm at jfadiman at gmail. And don't write me and ask, where can I get any materials? Because the answer is, I honestly work really, really hard not to know. And if you want serious information, you contact Adam and you take this course. There you go. <laughs> Well, guys, this has been really great, and I sincerely thank you all for your time and your perspective. And again, encourage any listeners who want a little more from all of you to check out the microdosing masterclass in the Psychedelic Education Center, where they will get hours and hours more on this topic. Thanks so much, guys. Great. Thank oh, we're so glad you're. Thank you, Victoria. This for us. Thank you. Thank you.